huge contributors to the uh, program of AA in the area um, in their own right. So, uh, <laughs> um, the topic tonight, <laughs> I'll give this to you after, the topic tonight is sh showing the prospect how the recovery solution applies to them. So I will turn the meeting, I don't, you guys can fight it out, um, to Carrie and Adam. Hi, I'm Carrie, I'm an alcoholic. Hi, um, You know, this is, it's an interesting topic. Uh, I think one of the ways for me, in my experience, that we, I can, we can show uh, and prospect how the recovery literature applies to them is by applying it ourselves. I mean, for me, and this is just my experience, the girls that I sponsor, you know, they don't come to me because, you know, I have all the answers in the world. I'm not, you know, I'm a housewife. I got, <laughs> you know, a college student. I'm not like, you know, I'm not real savvy, but I, I've been able, through the grace of God, to be able to stay sober for almost, you know, 14 years. You know, my sobriety date is September 6, 1994. You know, and by the grace of God, I've been able to stay clean. You know, and by the grace of God, the 12 steps and good sponsorship and a really good home group and, you know, a lot, a lot of prayer and a lot of God. And so the, here's the thing, is that in my experience, you can't, you can't convince somebody that they need God in their life. They have to find out for themselves, and they find out through failure. I found out through failure. I didn't walk into these rooms saying, I want God. I walked into these rooms saying, my life sucks, I can't stop drinking, I'm miserable, my family won't talk to me, nobody will talk to me, I'm alone, I can't even keep a job at like a Mandy's clothing store, you know, I, I can't walk into a, uh, you know, into a store and buy food without shaking and here's your five dollars, you know, I mean, I can't function in society. You know, and I, I walked into these rooms because of that. I didn't walk in here knowing that I had that soul in my soul. I didn't walk in here knowing that I needed God in my life. I didn't walk in here knowing that I needed the 12 steps. I didn't understand any of those things. What I understood was whatever it was that was going on in my life didn't work. And that was like the, the extent of it. I couldn't even think past, like, this sucks. You know, um, you know, I was 18 years old, and I was scared, and I was alone. And I, and I think the day that I totally knew that my life, the way that I had been living it, wasn't working, was when I was walking uh, in East Orange, and my mother was driving home from work, and I was, I was like maybe three or four weeks past my 18th birthday, and I had, you know, I would run away and blah, 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 living wherever, doing whatever. And um, my mother was driving home from work, and she saw me, and our eyes connected, and she kept driving. You know, and there's her, you know, 18-year-old daughter standing on the corner of East Orange in a known spot, and she didn't stop. She didn't see the point in it. And I continued to drink for several more months, and it wasn't, you know, until the grace of God that I was able to stop, but I didn't know that, was, that I had a spiritual malady. I didn't know that my life was unmanageable. I mean, I knew it was unmanageable. I didn't know why. I didn't know what unmanageability was. I thought that everybody did stuff to me. My life sucked. I was a victim of everything, and I needed to drink because of that. I didn't understand anything more than that. And it wasn't until I came into this program that somebody showed me. And really, what it was was that I saw that it worked in other people. That we, and, and there is a solution that talks about, uh, about seeing the hopelessness and futility of life as we've been living it. You know, and that we saw that it worked in others. And we had come to believe that it could work for us. And for me, that is how we show, or I show, prospects that the, that the AA literature applies to them, is by applying it to my life by being that miracle. By all intents and purposes, I shouldn't be sitting here. People like me don't get clean. People like me don't stop drinking. People like me don't have the life that I have. You know, I'm pregnant with my fourth child. I've been married for 14 years. I'm in graduate school. I couldn't get out of high school. I got thrown out of five high schools. You know, I'm in graduate school. I could afford graduate school. I mean, think about this for a minute here. I was, I, I lived out of a black garbage bag on the streets. I'm in graduate school. This is utterly bizarre for me, you know. You know, I have to keep saying it again, like, holy crap, I'm in graduate school. You know, um, you know and people like me don't have lives like this. The, and that's the truth, is like somebody like me doesn't have a child that's the, a daughter who's 13 years old who doesn't smoke or do drugs. 
who comes home and goes to bed at 9.30 at night like my children do. You know, people like me don't pay their bills and, and, and show up and have a car that runs. People like me don't have that. People like me die an alcoholic death, miserable, horrible, disgusting. You hear about them on the news, you hear the rumors, you see it in, you know, and then you go from being one of those cautionary tales to being a normal member of society where you wouldn't know that I was an alcoholic. You don't know, unless I tell you. And then you don't believe me. And the funniest thing that happens to me with the women I sponsor, now I sponsor some of the most lowest of the low barrel women. Sorry, Jess. <laughs> she was actually a good one. She was a good one. She was actually high caliber. But, uh, <laughs> but a lot of the women I sponsor are like right out of jail. You know, if they have all their teeth, they're really lucky. Um, you know, if they have their kids, this is a good thing. Like this, the women I sponsor, you know, they don't have their license. They don't have their kids. They're, you know, they're facing time. You know, I don't get the women who are doing well. I get the women who have no other choice. And that's part of the other thing that it talks about, about showing people how this, how this litter applies. Because the bottom line, and the way that I lay it out is, what other choice do you have? Let's, let, let's look at this reasonably. The big book talks about it says we could die an alcoholic death or live on a spiritual basis. They're not easy alternatives to face, but they're the only alternatives that a real alcoholic are, has. You know, and I don't candy coat it. I don't fool around. I don't pretend that it's something that it's not. I don't pretend that it's flowery. I don't put the panache on it. I lay it out and say, look, you can die. In fact, one of my sponsees, she hates it because whenever she would say, I'm not going to do that, I said, well, go drink. Good luck with that one. And she'd be like, God damn it. <laughs> every, every time. I don't want to do that. I don't want to make that amends. Okay, go drink. See you later. Go drink and die. You know, because th th that's the reality of our situation. That's the reality of my situation. The reality of my situation is that if I don't do this, to present this information to people who are dying an alcoholic death and are desperate, is to put it just like that. And the fact is, is when I came in here, I may not have had the progression, because I was 18 years old. I had only been drinking for, I don't know, like I want to say nine years, you know. I, I drank... <laughs> alcoholically from the gate, and the fact is that once I started, I couldn't stop. The fact is that I had craving, and that once I started drinking, I couldn't stop. I had a mind that told me that everybody else drank like me, or I had a mind that told me this time it would be different. I had a mind that told me that... You know, I had a mind that told me who gives a crap about the consequences because it'll make the pain go away now. Mm -hmm. And that's the reality of the situation for me, is like I didn't drink so much. I mean, I liked it, but I mean, most of it was because I just didn't want to be here. And I think that when I talk to women and, and when we explain this in those terms, that for me, that drinking was about not being here, was about not, wanting, not feeling that pain, not being present, shutting off the voices of a thousand monkeys that, was in my, that were in my head, that spiritual malady that we talk about in the big book, the bedevilments, you know, that alcohol turned that down and made that go away for even just five minutes, and that five minutes was worth whatever consequence I got, and I didn't care. And for me, it's been my experience that when I can speak to a person on that level and reach them, not on the how much we drank and what happened to us and how many cars did we wreck and blah, blah, a writhing nerve, and the only thing that quiets that are two things. It was alcohol or God. The only problem is that alcohol brings a whole lot of trouble, and the fact is, is that I can't ever turn it off. I don't get done with alcohol, it gets done with me. God's a different story. And when I, when I talk to a woman on that level, no matter who they are or where they come from, I'm able to, I think, convey that. And I think they understand that I know what they're talking about, that emotional pain. Because the bottom line is that that's that thing that drives us. That's the engine that drives my sickness. And that's why the 12 steps were designed the way they were, because they're not designed to treat our drinking. It's understood that once you start the 12 steps, you're not going to drink. I mean, that's why in the early on we called it AA, absolute abstinence, because the idea is that you're going to stop drinking. The, I, the whole point of the 12 steps is not to treat the actual physical drinking, it's to treat that spiritual malady that makes drinking seem like a good idea. Knowing what we know about alcoholism, knowing what, what I know about what alcohol does to me, that makes it look like a good idea that I should do that. Or it makes it like a good... Well, it doesn't really work where... I just automatically think booze. What happens to me is I think men. I think money. I think I can lose 10 pounds. 
if I'm just 10 pounds thinner and my boobs are a little bigger and I got a husband who's got a fatter wallet and I got a bigger house and, you know, and I got a nicer car, everything will be okay. And I start thinking like that. I start relying on human power. My problems pile up and they become astonishingly difficult to solve. And then drinking seems like a really good idea. So for me, it, it's almost like I, I ease my way away from God and towards booze. And that it doesn't, for me, alcohol doesn't look like alcohol. Alcohol looks like you. Alcohol looks like yourself. As in people's opinions, my ego. I start to get sicker and sicker, and my sick, sickness feeds on itself. So the idea for me is to be the example of what recovery looks like by treating that. I treat that. I don't want to drink anymore. And my sickness doesn't feed on itself the way that it used to. And people can see that. People can sense that freedom. When they look, when they look at a recovered alcoholic, a recovered alcoholic, people sense that freedom and they know that. It's hard for them to fathom it. And it's one of the things, I, I get it all the time from the women I sponsor. Like, they have a hard time believing I was as sick as I am, or as I was. And I have to call my husband over and I'll be like, look, you got to tell, just tell her, please, because she doesn't believe me. And, and you know, for me, that's a damn miracle that the women I sponsor have a hard time listening to me talk about what, what it was like, and they can't connect who I am with who I was because there's such a huge, huge chasm between who I was and who I am. For me, one, that's a miracle, and two, that's proof. And that, to me, that is proof that the literature applied to alcoholism is a good idea. I don't need to do anything more than that. But here's the thing, is that when I slip, when I'm not feeding my spirit, when I'm relying on self, people see that too. And, you know, drunk or sober, people know when you're full of crap. They just do. A sponsor, in a lot of ways, works as a surrogate to God. And I don't mean that I'm my, my sponsee's gods. It's not like that at all. But the idea is this, is that when I first started in this program and told me to pray to a God, I mean, I would talk to air, and I didn't really, I didn't feel it. I would just talk because you told me to. I, wouldn't, I didn't know what to say. I couldn't conceive of a higher power. I couldn't conceive of this higher power aiding me in any way, you know, beyond punishing me for the bad stuff that I did, which was a lot of stuff, you know, and I couldn't see beyond that. And so what I had to do is I had to trust that my sponsor knew something I didn't know. I had to trust that my sponsor's experience was true. I had to trust that she was who she said she was. I had to watch her feet. You know, I, you heard this room, in this room a thousand times, watch your feet. I had to watch her feet and say, you know, is she really doing what she says she's doing? Is she cutting corners? Can I trust her? And ultimately, it was by watching her feet, by being willing to trust what she told me and do what she said, even though I didn't really understand it and I didn't know what it was going to get me, but I figured I might as well try because anything was better than what I was doing. By doing that and allowing her to work as a surrogate for my higher power, I was able to develop a relationship with a higher power because I had to trust something tangible. And if it was her experience and her sponsor's experience and her sponsor's sponsor's experience and all of her friends and all of the people who were around her who were doing this and having this experience and were manifesting something that I couldn't comprehend, then that was enough. So for me, what I need to do is attend my ride a little bit or because I can skip morning meditation here and there and do a crappy nightly review and I could not kill people because I've learned how to behave. And after 13 years, you learn how to behave and how to look sober. But to have that awakened spirit, to have that, that sense of life within you, that lack of fear, that sense of hope and freedom. I mean, for me, that's the most attractive thing. And and that's what, you know, when, when, when the women that I work with, and they're like, well, why do I have to do this? I'm like, well, do you want to die? Do you want to be free? How free do you want to be? And ultimately, those are the questions, you know, that I have to pose to myself, and then I help the women that I sponsor pose to themselves. There was a woman I sponsored um, a couple of years ago who um, came to me through Al-Anon, and she wasn't sure if she was an alcoholic, and I brought her through the first you know, chapters, brought her through the first step, did the whole thing, and she still wasn't sure, wasn't convinced, wasn't convinced, wasn't convinced. And after quite a bit, I, I brought her to the liquor store. I said, pick out your favorite bottle. I'm buying it. 
So I brought her, and she picked out what she wanted. You could tell she was drooling. She was dancing from one foot to the other, one foot to the other. She got this bottle. She's holding it. She's like, I got a bottle. My sponsor's buying me booze. This is the best thing ever. You know, so I bought her this bottle, and I brought her back to my house, and I said, here's what you got to do. You got to put this on the kitchen table next to a big book. And again, we've heard this in this room, and it's, this works, man. Because nothing like personal experience will beat me to a state of reasonableness. I'm sorry. It's alcoholism that convinces me that I need God. It's alcoholism that convinces me I need the 12 steps. It's alcohol recovery. And if alcohol hasn't beaten you to a state of reasonableness, you can hear the most beautiful gems, the most gorgeous things. I mean, there have been, I've sat in this room and been reduced to tears. I have been electrified. I've had goosebumps up and down. I've held my seat like, oh my God, I'm going to fall out of this chair because what I heard just knocked, knocked my socks off. And you know what? If my spirit wasn't open, if I wasn't beaten into a state of reasonableness by my alcoholism, it wouldn't matter. Because ultimately, it's that state of reasonableness, it's that willingness, that openness, that defeatedness that creates that climate, that atmosphere of recovery. You know, so I told her, take the bottle, put it on, put it on her table with the big book and ask herself, which is going to be easier, booze or the alcohol? And I said, well, if you drink it, here's the deal. You can have one drink. That's it. Put the cap in the bottle, put it away. And I want to see how long it takes you till you go back. woman had the bottle demolished by the end of the night and was on her, you know, on her second and third step by the next day and, you know, boom, bang, bing, you know, amends. But the point was, was that, and this is the thing, is that for me, it's a matter of just holding up that mirror to people and letting them look. Because that's, for me, what I was taught to do. That's what my sponsor does for me, ask me the rough questions. I'm hated. I, I'm telling you, there's not a woman that I've sponsored that I haven't been on their inventory. They hate my guts, and they tell me to my face. I've had, like, I've been threatened. <laughs> it's bad. I mean, I've been physically threatened, where, like, I had a woman, like, three inches from my face, and she was like, you know, if, it, I, I, if, if I was on the street, I'd beat the crap out of you. And people asked me those hard questions, and they held that mirror. They didn't allow me to lie to myself. They held me accountable. They showed me an example of what recovery looked like. And as a sponsor, I got to be willing to do that. I have to lose my fear of what people think of me. I have to lose the fear of being not liked. Because the bottom line is, if you're going to sponsor, you're going to carry this message, people are not going to like you. They're going to love you. And there are women that I've sponsored for years and that I don't sponsor anymore over the years who love me, who would like throw themselves, you know, would do anything for me. But they freaking hated me too. They hated my guts, and I heard about it because it's funny things. It's like, you know, when they become my friends or when I hear stuff from other people or I sponsor their friends, they're like, oh. Or what, what I love is when I sponsor a woman and I go to her home group and all of her little sponsees and all her friends, they, they look at me and they give me like that wide berth and they're like, is she going to spit fire? And then, and then I just open my mouth and I'm like, hey, what's up, man? And they're like, oh, she's not evil yet until I sponsor you and then I become evil. But this is part of it, is holding people accountable by asking those questions about not being, not caring. Not caring if they don't like you, not caring if they talk crap about you, not caring if they threaten you. I've tossed people out of my house. Yeah, I have to be willing to do that because the bottom line is this, is that it's no skin off my nose. It really isn't. I mean, it, so what, somebody doesn't like me. So what, a sponsee is mad at me. So what, a woman fires me. Really, I mean, what, it, what does it really cost me? But you know what, if I'm not honest, if I don't, I'm using them, saying I have all these sponsees and everybody loves me and everybody thinks I'm a great guru because I'm handing out pearls because they're not being held accountable, they're not being helped, they're not being asked the hard questions, and then they drink and, and then, who is, that, who is that laying on? That lays on me. Not because I'm their God and I made them drink, but because I failed to do my job because I was afraid that they would, they would not like me. Well, you know, after many years of failing at carrying this message because I was afraid to do that because my fear of you not liking me was greater than my desire to truly help you. You know, God removed that from me through a lot of inventory. And this is what I'm saying, personal recovery comes first. A lot of inventory and a lot of browbeating from the people who would come, my sponsor and my sponsor sponsors and my sponsor sponsors and my personal recovery heroes who would ask me, like, how dare you? And I, I'd be like, oh, oh, yeah. You know, and this is, again, personal recovery. And it was it's so funny because a, a good friend of mine says that, says that AA unity is dependent upon personal recovery. 
And the reason why is because if we don't have personal recovery, we can bring nothing to the fellowship and nothing to the program. Because I'm not, if I don't bring my awakened spirit to the fellowship, if I bring a sickened sick spirit, all I bring is sickness. I bring sickness and disease everywhere I go. Because of course, there's no carrying to the message. There's no convincing a newcomer or a prospect or, you know, someone that, that, that this program works because I ain't working and, and nobody wants what I have. You know? <laughs> but, so the idea here is that it's my personal recovery that comes first and it's by that awakened spirit, by that willingness and lack of fear, that rely. And if I bring my sickened spirit to, to AA and I exercise my demons and I feed my ego... You know, I'm not helping anybody, and all I'm doing is dying an alcoholic death in these rooms. And that's not what I'm here for. You know, ultimately, I'm here because I don't want to drink. I mean, that's why I came here. I mean, I've certainly gotten so many more benefits. I mean, so I've gotten so many, so many awesome things, like, you know, a relationship with a higher power, a sense of contentment, a sense of peace and ease. I've had spiritual experiences. I've had the white light spiritual experiences that are described in the big book. It took me a couple years to get them, but I got them, man. I mean, that's awesome. I have actual, factual experience with God to say, absolutely, at that moment, I knew there was a power greater than myself without a freaking doubt. That's freaking awesome. But I didn't come here for that. I came here because I was going to die. You know, I came here for that, and I got a whole lot more. My expectations were quite low, and, I, and they have been surpassed by trillions. And that's the awesome thing about this program, is that if I keep my expectations low, and I just don't want to drink, and that's really it. I mean, like, the women that I work with who don't make it are the women who come here for every other reason but their alcoholism. They come here for the guy, the kid, the job, the thing, the license, the money, the whatever, and you know what? In my experience, and this is just it, is that if I'm not beaten, by, beaten to a state of reasonableness by my alcoholism as opposed to my husband or boyfriend telling me, I'm going to leave you, you know, if it's not coming from within me and it's an external circumstance, ultimately, when it was obvious that they came for another reason, and I've asked them directly, like, you really need to take this into meditation. Why are you here? Like, why am I sponsoring you? Like, what is the point of this? You know, you missed four appointments. Yeah, you know, you've been on your first column and your fourth step, like, for, like, six weeks now. This is ridiculous. You know, you, I can write that in the bathroom in 15 minutes, you know. I'm like, what's going on here? You know, like, why are you here? And I've had them say, I don't want to do this AA thing. I'm just here because I wanted to keep so-and-so happy. I'm like, well, that's good. Why don't you come back when you're ready to treat your alcoholism? I'll be your friend. And they call me, and they talk to me about their stuff, and I listen. And I keep those, those lines open, but I will not take them any further if they do not have a first step. And if they're not willing to get one and they got to be beaten to a state of reasonableness by their alcoholism, whether that's clean or sober, let them have that experience. And I, and I keep those lines of communications open. And so what happens is when, when they're ready, if it's not me, I can get them to somebody else who can help them. So I can bring them down here. And I've brought many a woman here on a Tuesday night said, go talk to her. You know, I've brought, you know, I've given them phone numbers and email addresses. I do this all the time, you know, because the bottom line is that if we're not ready and if we start this process and we stop, we're in way more danger than if we never started at all, in my experience. So as a sponsor, part of this is knowing whether or not the person that I'm working with is ready and asking those questions and not just rushing somebody through the work because I want to get them done. If they don't have a first step, there's no point in doing it because they ain't doing their ninth. They're not doing anything more. And I'd be lucky if I can get them through their fourth. And that's the truth. Because once, once the external circumstance fixes itself, there's no need for this and there's no need for God. There's no need for AA and sayonara. I am. I don't mean money. I mean service. You know, can I have a ride? I'll give you a ride, but you better have that fourth step on your, you know, on your lap and it better be done. And if I show up at your house to give you a ride to the store for your kid and you don't have your four-step done, you're writing in the car in the parking lot, you know? And that's really how I roll. I mean, I'm willing to go to any length to help you. But if you're not willing to go to any length for recovery, if you can't meet me even halfway, then let me know when you're going to do that because I'm not going to... Because the bottom line is that if I do it for you, if my sponsor did it for me, I wouldn't be sitting here. I'd be drunk. If my sponsor made it easy on me and let me get away with crap and didn't ask me the hard questions, all those things, and didn't... If I ever showed up at Cass's house with a half-written four-step, I'd be tossed out on my ear. I mean, I'm serious. There's no freaking way that woman would have tolerated that. 
you know, that's the bottom line, but <laughs> that's a whole nother story. But I mean, the bottom, the, the thing is, is that, is it, the women that I sponsor know they have to meet me halfway. They know what they're in for, and I lay it out in the very beginning. But I also make it really clear, like, if you're willing to do this work, there's nothing I won't do for you, including detoxing you on my couch. I've done that a million times. Giving you a ride to detox a hundred times if that's what you got to do. Giving you food, feeding your kid, feeding you, babysitting. Giving you a ride to diapers. Giving you a ride. I mean, like, this is what we do. But the, but the thing is, is this, is that I'm not going to enable somebody to kill themselves either. That's really like all my experience that I'm going to share. I left the, the, our house meeting and a lot of that other stuff with my husband. I didn't want to steal everything because that would be mean and showboating. So I want to thank you for letting me share and I'm going to turn it over to him. Hi, everybody. My name is Adam Andrick. I'm a recovered alcoholic. She really was sick. <laughs> now, um, this, is a, this is an interesting topic, and it's a, it's a weird uh, start. I, I, I think uh, what I'll... Uh, start off with is I, I uh, we opened up our doors when we first got sober um, my uh, my sponsor at the time I called him up one night and I was freaking out and you know not knowing what to do and something was going on in my life and I don't even remember what the issue was but he said Adam you know what to do grab a drunk and I was like what are you talking about and I'm like a month sober and he goes, so grab somebody with 29 days you know, um, and from that moment on, we had a, uh, before my kids were born, we had, a, we had a rule that as long as you wanted to be sober, you were allowed in our house, and our house became kind of like hangout central for the young people trying to get clean, you know, trying to get clean was the, you know, smoke crack in our bathroom, you know, we had, uh, people shoot dope in our bathroom we had somebody steal our piggy bank and you know engagement. yeah engagement ring that was a good one um but you know what uh, with with all that stuff that went down you know the all the all the chaos that came with all that i i would i would never go back and change that because it kept me clean it kept me sober in the beginning because i had no idea what i was doing um when we first uh, were graced with recovery, um, there was nobody doing this, nobody doing this, this, this step thing, you know. Um, I would go to a, a, a big book meeting. It was supposed to be a study on a Thursday night, and everybody would identify with the jaywalker, you know, and we would read the... The, the first 164 pages, like it was a novel, you know, nobody understood that it was a textbook, and, um, you know, it was just what was going on at the time, it, it, this was, this was not commonplace, and, 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 like I said, I had no, I really had no idea what I was doing, but the one thing that I did know is that I needed to carry the message, I needed to reach out, I needed to be of service, um, you know, I started to read this book, and, and, and the way literature, you know, the, the powerful thing about it is, is I, I was given, you know, and I realized that I was supposed to transmit this or give this to other people, um, but I was still grabbing around in the dark, and I was still trying to figure out what we were doing, and, and, and in doing so, I learned a lot of what not to do. You know, I learned, a, I, ha, I made a lot of mistakes along the way and, and, and did things kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, being a sick, egotistical, self-centered alcoholic, you know, I had to go out and I had to change AA, you know, and convince everybody that they were doing it wrong, you know. So I went into my nearest 12 and 12 meeting and we're reading the second step and I open up to we agnostics and I start pointing out to the meeting where they're doing it wrong. You know, and I taught people how this literature doesn't apply to them. You know, you don't want to be an arrogant, you know, egotistical, self-righteous, big book thumper. You know, 
and, and I had to go back and make amends for that stuff. You know, um, it took me a while to to figure this out. And what what it what it took was actually finding other people who were doing the same thing. You know, and that took a few years. Um, in those first few years, what held it together was the was the act of trying to carry the message, was was going into that meeting, and yeah, being an arrogant, self righteous, you know, jerk off, you know, turning everybody off, but grabbing that guy who's still wet, you know, the guy who's been around for 15 years and can't get clean, and bringing him back to my house, you know, and sitting him on the couch and and trying to read the book to him and trying to have but I was still trying to grasp the, the, the meaning behind all this, you know. Um, and it kept me clean, you know. It kept me sober long enough to find people who were along this path, to find people who were doing the same thing that could guide me, you know. Um, and I don't, I don't think anybody in those first few years actually got sober, you know, by what we were doing. But you know what? I've since seen people coming around. You know, people from those first few years, I've seen them in these rooms, you know, in these, in these big book oriented rooms, you know, and it's kind of neat, you know, and, and they'd, they'd bring up, you know, that we brought them somewhere or we did something or our house meeting or whatever. And it's really neat to see that, you know. But the bottom line is, is, is that it, it kept me clean, you know. The act of being of service, you know. And without, I wrote some inventory. I wrote some inventory about a year ago. Um, it, it, something really irked me. It was the, um, it was a principle of um, selfless, selfless acts with self-seeking motives. I'm going to help you because it helps me. You know, I, I don't believe in that. I don't think that that's. I don't think that that's what the idea of service is all about you know i'm not helping you because i want to get better it's a by you know, when i was first getting sober they told me i had to find god in order to get clean and i had such a wicked resentment with religion and uh i had no no ability to to see a a, a deity at that point and the one thing that i was able to grab onto as a, as a higher power was the concept of principles you know, the, the spiritual principles that are common in all the world's religions was able to work for me at that point. And, and the main one was the unselfishness, you know, to strive for that unselfishness, that act of service, you know. Um, it, it, that it, at the core is, is what I'm shooting for. Now, don't get me wrong. If I'm, if I'm being of service in order to get better, great. Hopefully down the road I'll I'll get to that point, you know. But for me, if I'm being if I'm being of service, in order for me to get something out of it, I'm missing the mark, you know, for myself. That's not what I want. That's not what I'm trying to do here, you know. I'm trying to become a better human being, you know. I'm trying because because I know, you know. Um, Carrie talked about wanting to coming here in order to not die. You know, I'm a, I'm a hopeless drunk. I'm a, I'm a hopeless, diehard, gutter alcoholic. You know, and I've said this over the, over the years a lot, is, is, is I'm, not, I'm not necessarily here for that guy in the, in the suit with the two cars in the garage and the house. And, you know, I'm here for the dirtbag that's laying in the gutter, you know, who can't get it. Because that's who I was. You know, I lived on the streets for years. You know, I slept in basements. I ate out of garbage cans. That's my, that's some, something better. I'm going back to that, you know. I'm going to go back to that life. You know, if I give in to self, if I give in to being selfish and I, and I, and I don't practice this unselfish lifestyle, I'm going to go back to that because that's what it was all about, you know. That's what that whole life was about, was about me getting what I wanted, doing what I wanted, not having to worry about anything and not giving a shit about what it did to anybody else. You know, that's all it was about. And um, I, can't, I can't give in to any of that. And I learned that through this, this process. You know, um, I came here because I needed to stop drinking. And, and I realized in order for me to stop drinking, 
something needed to change and it didn't have anything to do with the way I dressed or my haircut. You know, they told me I had to stop listening to Grateful Dead when I came in here and I told them to go screw themselves, you know, because the bottom line is, is none of that matters. It's something that changes inside, you know. Um, I, remember, I remember the first night that I didn't put on my ripped up holy jeans and, you know, my, my ratty old t-shirt. And I actually put on some nice clothes and, you know, a decent pair of clean shoes and a button-down shirt. And I went to a meeting looking civilized, you know, for the first time. Not because of any external circumstance, nothing. There was no special night, no celebration meeting. There was no nothing. Just because I felt like it that is, is, is these, these guys that I come across, we invite them into our home. You know, I don't talk to guys in a meeting. You know, I do, but that's not where it is. That's not where it happens. You know, people, I go to meetings in order to meet people to invite them back to the house. And then we sit down in our, in, 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 at, on a, at the kitchen table, at the couch, in the computer room, and we talk. And they see the way I interact with my family. They see the way we live our life. You know, it's a matter of watching what I do, not listening to what I say. You know, and that's what was taught to me. You know, Kerry talked about watching, looking, looking where your feet are at. You know, and that was drilled into me. You know, don't, don't, don't listen to what I say. I'm an alcoholic. I lie. Watch what my feet do. You know, watch what my feet do. Watch the way I behave, the way I act. And that's where the real deal comes in. You know, on. just had a brain fart. Uh, <laughs> hmm. House meeting. <laughs> House meeting's been going on for uh, about 12 years now. And uh, we've recently stopped it. Um, we're taking, taking a hiatus for the summer. Because um, it, it, it's... You know, it, it takes a lot of work. It really does. And, and, and I love it and, it, and and I really enjoy what it does for me and for us. You know, you know, it's a balancing act between my family and my personal recovery. I know I'm benefiting from it, but I also need, uh, I, my family needs a break. You know, my family needs to be able to shut down and have a safe place. You know, the interesting thing is, is my kids have learned about this stuff through what we do you know that whole aspect of watching what I do well our kids see that you know I have a I have a, a 13 year old daughter and a nine-year-old son and a little monster that's about two and uh, but the 13 year old and the nine-year-old a few years ago we uh, we caught them uh, praying together you know my daughter we see on a pretty regular basis practicing meditation you know and, and, and it's really neat. It, it, it really is. It, it shows me that, that this stuff works, you know. And, and, it, and, it's, and to me, that's, that's really what this is all about. That's what the, the significance of this literature is. You know, in the very beginning, I, I thought it was about the, um, the dates and, the, and the, the instructions and dotting the I's and crossing the T's. And I had the perfect teacher's edition big book, you know, that had been to like 14 different workshops and had all the information you could ever imagine, you know, and, um, and I was transmitting information. And I was doing a good job of transmitting information. But it wasn't what it was. It wasn't what it was. It's not what this thing is. To me, it's, you know, the most powerful experience. I have no idea that this is coming, you know. Where'd this come from? I, I, I you know, I, and at the, at the time, we have a meeting going on, uh, I think it was Monday night, and uh, I'm bringing these guys through the work, and, and we're somewhere around the second step, right in the beginning, and uh, I'm calling somebody, I called up an old sponsor of mine, and I'm freaking out about what's going on, and he asked me to open up a blank book, you know, because at this time I got the book with all the notes. You know, and I'm reading the book and I'm reading the notes off to these guys and telling them the information. And he says, use a blank book. So I go in the next Monday and I start talking about the information and how it pertained in the past week and how it, 
how it worked with all this shit I was going through last week, you know. And I wrote inventory with these guys. And we did the second step proposition exercise with these guys, you know. I did all the work that they were doing week by week with a blank book. And I had this amazing experience because they... They seen it, I seen it. It was no longer transmitting information. It was actually a living, breathing thing. You know, and it was changing. And the stuff that was coming out of my mouth when I was reading this book, uh, it was nothing I ever said before. Because none of this had happened before. You know, and now I've I've come to rely on that. I've come to rely on this book changing and, and evolving and growing with me rather than that old you know, this is the inf- now believe, are you willing to believe, and you know, get down on your knees, and no, it's not about that, it's about the experience of it, you know, the experience of it inside, and, and, and that's what changed, and you know what, every single one of those guys that was sitting in that room that night is still clean today, and that ain't because of me, you know, but that just shows that it's an experience, you know, and it was, it was a, it was more about what was happening, and more about the living, breathing aspect of this rather than the information. And, you know, it's, I think that's, 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 that's really what, what this is all about. You know, watch what I do, don't listen to what I say, and live what this book says. You know, don't just do the work, you know. It, 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 to me, it, it isn't about the work. The, the, steps, the steps are no longer linear. You know, they kind of go in this circle thing, you know, and they and they they happen here, there, and everywhere. You know, it's no longer a process that I go through. Granted, I had to go through that process in the beginning to learn how the process works, you know, but it's no longer like that. You know, you know, I'll 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 stop in the middle of my day if I need to, and and I will start over. You know, and I used to hear people say that, and I didn't necessarily understand. You know, because this is a process; you have to do it. You know, in order, you know, you have to dot the I's and cross the T's and, you know, and, and it's not like that anymore.